field plant is very free to do so. Sir, you said you would need 100 million or 300 million dollars. We have enough land in Nigeria and we can give you one to start your steel plant. But the Jakuta as it stands today, it's not of commercial concern. It's a political and economic play. As we all know, just two days ago, Trump, President Trump of America, said that he's going to do everything possible to revive the steel sector in America because of what it stands because of what the people of America stand to gain with regards to job creation, even if it means increasing the tax tariffs for import steel, that is what Nigeria needs. It has nothing to do with sentiments of financial of, of, of money. And I'd like to say one more thing. Political will is one of the reasons why Jakarta is laying more rebound. And all the money in the world and all the technical expertise, even if every Nigerian today here becomes a steel expert, a metallurgist at that, if you do not have the political will and the decision from your heart, a patriotic movement, and leaders in place that will have this idea and share the same vision, Ayakuta will not move. So, permit me, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to put before the nation a few of such conspiracies with respect to the few individuals we would mention. I would not in any way or manner speak of anything that I do not have proof for. I'm very much aware of the risk that this befalls me. In 1994, when the Russians left, it was definitely the Soviet Union, I would call the company in particular, Chiaja from export. When they left in 1994, Jakuta was 98.2% completed. I have that in the letter they wrote two years ago to the President. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I would gladly share the letter with you at your call. And when they left, it was likely because Nigeria fell short on its contractual agreement. They were not paying, they were not putting forth funds. And the supporting infrastructure that would be needed to bring to place all the other resources were not in place. But that aside, Nigeria should know that we have several times had good opportunities to have the steel sector running. The very first was in 2001 under President Olusha Gwabasanjo. Two years ago when I visited Russia, I visited the People's University in Moscow. And right there in the hall, there's a big picture of President Olusha Gwabasanjo. And I asked, why is this picture here amongst other leaders of the world? And they said, he visited this university in 2001 when he visited Putin. And then I got curious. Why did he visit President Putin? And then I got to know that on March 7, 2001, there was actually a bilateral agreement entered into between Nigeria and Russia in furtherance to the transfer of high technology. And Ajakuta still was actually, and Ajakuta still was actually one of the issues. Based on that bilateral agreement and others, 40 steel experts were sent by the same company, the original builders, Jerusalem experts. And they worked here alongside with Nigerian experts to develop the technical and financial reports, which were supposed to be used to formalize the revival and modernization of a Jakarta steel plant. But after that, surprisingly, the Nigerian side went quiet. In 2003, President Putin sent a letter, wrote a letter to President Obasanjo. Mr. Speaker, it's a short letter. Do you mind if I read that? It reads, Dear Mr. President, as we mentioned to you during our meetings in Moscow in March 2001, trade and economic cooperation between the Russian Federation and the Federal Republic of Nigeria has significant potential good prospects for further development and deepening of relations. One of the important directions of cooperation between our countries in this sphere in the completion of construction and commissioning of metallurgical plants in Ajakuta town. The realization of this plant will contribute to the solution of a number of economic and social challenges faced by Nigeria in a strategic nature setting an example of partnership in the field of industry and high technologies to lay the foundation for new joint plans 
in the energy sector, telecommunications, and petroleum refinery. He went further to say, the Russian side has completed the preparation of technical proposals for the company in Ajakuta and worked through issues of financial provision. We hope the state enterprise, the Ajakuta Export, and its partner in Nigeria, which is the ministry, will soon be able to successfully conclude negotiations on this large-scale project and to begin its realization. Using this opportunity, Mr. President, I would like to confirm our mindset to a comprehensive strengthening of Nigerian-Russian relations. Yours faithfully, Vladimir Putin. I would like to say that at this point, the technical reports were already submitted to the Nigerian side, that's the ministry, and Russia had gone ahead to secure the monies for, that would be used to complete the plan from BNP Paribas. Two months after, President Olisha Go Obasanjo responded. In his response, the only place where he mentioned Ajakuta, I will read those. First of all, allow me to thank you for your kind message. Ajakuta really occupies an important place in our agenda, and I appreciate the fact that you also find this project a priority in our bilateral relations. I will not bore you with the rest of the content, but it has to do with supply of military equipment and stuff. That was the response our president gave in response to the letter from Putin. And the very next month after this letter, Ajakuta Steel and Niyomko, which is the iron ore company in Itape, we are given to a company called Solgas. Solgas Energy at that time was not qualified and had, well, permit me, I'm not supposed to give my own opinions. Solgas Energy was given the concession of Ajakuta and Itape. And if this honorable, court, this honorable house recalls, probably from your archives, this, there was a session called a few months after because the house was worried that no activities were, take, were being taken, were, was taking place in Itape and Ajakuta. And the conclusion there to Solgas was they should go to Russia and call, partner with the original builders as technical experts, but they went to India and brought in Iceblad, which is known today as Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited. So in truth, the Indian company that we so know today was brought in as technical partners to sell gas. So from then on, I will not bore you again, but the facts are all there. Nigeria entered due to, I would not, maybe probably should I say the mistake that President of Polish of God when conducted, where for some reason he found Solgas more qualified than the people who actually built that place. That is one on one part. The second part of it, I will say here, because if the minister were to be here, he would have talked about the arbitration in England, in the courts. So I would briefly brush through that. On the 2nd of April 2008, at the Federal Executive Council, the Federal Executive Council met and late Yaradua terminated the concession. I quote late Yaradua, after considering the report of the administrative panel of inquiry established by the Yaradua administration to review the concession agreements and determine the extent of compliance by both parties, the council agreed with its findings that the agreements were largely skewed in favor of the concessionaire to the detriment of the federal government of Nigeria. I have the report here. This is the Inua Magaji report, duly certified by the Ministry of Solid Minerals. It contains documents, facts, and figures and even pictorial evidences of the vandalization that took place. I am surprised why Nigeria did not present this before the court in England and rather said we have no proof. How can we have no proof? Why did the Soviet Mineral, the Minister, Andre Bokayo, defy me 
reconcession, it has been back to the same people that vandalized it because there was no proof. This is the proof. In my hands, I also have the rules of... In my hands, I also have... A I also have the rules of the International Chamber of Commerce. The arbitration court had its first session, and this is the rules. From this report, when I read back, I read from page to page. It is signed here, duly, by the ex-Attorney General of the Federation, Mohamed Bello Adoki. I could tell here that Nigeria was clearly winning the case. If you read these rules, Mr. Speaker, I will submit this to Kandi Fee. You will tell them there was no reason for Nigeria to settle for out of court, go for out of court settlement. If we had proceeded this diligently, we would have had a Jakuta and Itape back in our hands. Well, it says in our hands technically, but for some clauses. Because towards the end, you could clearly state. It states here, in 9.2.3, claimants, who is the global infrastructure, because they took us to court, claimants have not demonstrated enough, claimants have not proved enough sufficient evidence that they will suffer irre irreparable harm. All the points here were claimants have not demonstrated, claimants have not demonstrated. So you may read this, Nigeria was clearly winning. But to our surprise, the Attorney General applied for an out-of-court settlement and President Jonathan granted. The out-of-court settlement, the out-of-court settlement brought about the reconcession agreement. And the terms of the reconcession agreement stated that Itaque should be given back to Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited because Nigeria owes Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited $525 million. If you recall, the Minister, Honorable Kayode Fayemi, said several times that it was the court in London that actually told us to pay that amount. And Nigeria does not have $525 million. Therefore, the only option we have is to give them, give it back to them to complete their eight years. Uh, seven, they completed the 10 years since they had done three years. Permit me, I would like to read from the letter, the memo the Attorney General Adoke wrote to President Jonathan on the 12th of December. It's duly signed by his signature as an eight page attested. Item 6. Item 6A. In light of the fact that the presidential committee had estimated damages, please, I'm going to go through this again because it's very important. Item 6A reads, in light of the fact that a presidential committee had estimated damages payable to global in the region of $525 million, million the agreement of global to waive its right to damage a substantial achievement. This shows you that there was a presidential committee that was cooked up, put together, people of like mind promoting a particular interest. And it was that committee that actually indicted Nigeria to the amount of $525 million. It is not the courts in England, sir. It was a committee. And I do have a list of the members of the committee, which I will share with you later. I would just say, I would just say that it was headed by the vice president, Sambo. That's it. But people from the attorney general's office. People from, representatives from BPE, they were all present, sir. 
So going by this proof, it shows that our country is not binded by, the, by such a decision of a committee. And I would like this honorable court to demand the, re the oh, sorry, forgive me. Okay. I would like, appreciate this honorable house to demand for the report of that committee. It would be interesting to know the parameters in which they arrived at such a decision. Knowing full well that there was also the Inua Magadji report, which clearly itemized the damage and even the monies borrowed from CBN without being paid.